When God created the earth and the sky, then God said, Let there be light, and light began to shine. And God saw that it was good. If you have so seen, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in light, bursting in living color, I see the world your way, and I'm walking in the light. 
God did this and that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Thus he is not far from any one of us. Acts 17 verse 27 Good morning and welcome to Turning Point Church Online. You know, it is so great to see you here this morning. It's a Sunday today and I can tell you that there's no better place to be than right here at church. So why don't you go ahead and click that share button below, invite your friends, invite 10, 20, your family, make sure they're not missing out on hearing the great news of the gospel and being a part of the community of the kingdom of God. If you are here, go ahead and comment that you are here. Send us a wave, a high five, a love heart. Do all those things. And if you feel encouraged in any way by whatever's going on in the service today, make sure you type a big fat amen in, that, in those comments. We want to hear from you. We want to stay connected. We want to enjoy this together as a family. Now let's start our service. Let's go straight into some praise and worship through songs with our Resonance team right now. Free to love you. 
Good morning, Cranbourne. How are you? I'm just about to bring you um, through the time of communion this morning. And um, I just wanted to read from you from Psalm 133. It says, How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe and... It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. So this might seem like a strange um, sort of psalm to pick to do communion with. But I wanted to talk this morning about people living together in unity. Now I know that we've been shut in our houses and not seeing many people um, but we're still, we're still united as a people of God. And even though we haven't seen each other physically for a while, we're still united and we're still God's children. And I'm just praying that there is peace in your homes because I know what it's like being shut in with, with your family. They drive you batty after a while. So we're just praying for peace in our homes and unity of the church. So um, when we take communion, when we come around the table of the Lord for communion, we are in unity. We're in unity together um, as a people of God, as a turning point church. Everybody at this same time, all the Christians all over the world, at this same time, Sunday morning, will be celebrating communion together. So, you know, it's our family, it's our church, it's our church campuses, it's our CRC denomination, it's the Christian um, worldwide 
the, the un, universal church of Christ. So, you know, God is pleased when he looks down from heaven and he sees us celebrating communion together in unity. That's where he bestows his blessings, you know, and, and for us, his blessing, his, you know, he blesses us every day. He provides for us all the time, but his main blessing for us is eternal life. So praise God for that. So this um, talks about the oil being poured down and running down, running down Aaron's beard and running down the collar of his robe. And um, then the next verse talks about the dew on Mount Hermon falling onto Mount Zion. Um, The dew of Hermon were were falling on on Mount Zion, sorry. And so... That dew falling and the oil running reminds me of the precious blood of Jesus that was pouring out of his body as he was whipped and beaten and nailed and pierced. So his blood flowed from his body um, just like this oil was running down um, on Aaron's beard. And it was there at the cross that God poured out his blessings and literally life evermore. Jesus went to, the, to his grave and then he was resurrected and after another 40 days, then he's ascended into heaven for eternal life. And that's where we're going to be when we die. We're going, as believers in Jesus, we're going to eternity with him. So um, just as we come around this time of communion, let's get your, your bread ready and the cup. Let's, um, if you're sitting down, stand up, praise the Lord, um, and let's take this, um, this bread. You know, the Lord said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's just think about, as we take this communion today, let's think about how, how precious his blood is, his body that, that was um, beaten for us. Let's think about, that um, blood pouring out and that's where God the Father bestows his blessings. Thank you, Jesus. In the same way, Jesus said, this is a cup of my new covenant, covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And we just praise him that he he went through that man um, of... Um, resolve, that he resolved to do that and he went through with it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the cup. Mighty God, we thank you for your peace at this time. You are the Prince of Peace. Lord, we thank you that um, for the unity that you've bestowed on us as a body of Christ. And Lord, we pray at this time that that your peace will transcend the families, the homes of our, our, our fellow Christians, Lord. That peace in the world, when we go out into the world, that we will have your peace amongst us, that we will be salt and light to the world in these times. And Lord Jesus, we thank you above all that you went to the cross to save us, to save sinners like me. Lord, you went to the cross with us in mind so that we might join you in eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining with us in communion today. Now let's have a look at what's coming up in the next weeks and in future.
Y'all ready? Our main aim is to stay connected with each and every one of you. So make sure you use those numbers. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Check our website often to see what's going on because we will always have something on because we want to be here for you. Now, let's go into our tithes and offerings with Pira. Hi Church. Um, I'm going to start off by reading 1 John 3 verse 16 to 18. Um, if you want to read with me, go along. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So there are two things I want to highlight in the scripture. First one is God's love in action. And the second one is God meets our needs. And then I'm going to follow that up with the word opportunity. I know for many during this time, it's been a time of uncertainty and drastic change. There's no denying that it's had its effects. But I also have seen for many more of you out there that it's been a time of opportunity. A time in our workplaces, uh, with our families close and extended. A time to be a beacon of hope, a voice of godly reassurance. And in Matthew 5, verse 16, for some of us, it's, it's been a time to shine your light for all to see. As I bring the message of tithing and giving, that's what I want to share with you. Opportunity. It's defined as a time or a set of circumstances to do something. So firstly, I want to say it's to help your brother in need. Your giving is to help others. On the news, you may have heard the statement, we're in this together. Well, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 13, it refers to Christians collectively as a body of Christ and that we are family. And as family, during this time, we are all in this together. You may not be an evangelist or have a public platform for God, but your tithing and generous giving is support. It's to help our local community, um, aids the program set up in our church, and it also goes towards the sustainability and growth to our Turning Point family. You're meeting the need. Also, I wanted to point out, it's an opportunity to invest in God's kingdom here on earth. I'm talking about the global mission fields, um, the planting of international churches, schools, and if you go on our website, um, you can have a look at all of that. Your giving is building future leaders, it's changing poverty to treasures in heaven that is internal. And lastly, your giving is an opportunity to rise up to the challenge, to the challenges and make a difference. One of the reasons why I love and serve God is when the world sees obstacles, God sees opportunities to make a difference and to make a change. When there seems to be no way, God makes a way. So today, I challenge you that when you tithe and give offering, you're taking a time or a set of circumstances to do something. You're putting God's word into action and you're stepping out in faith because you know despite what's happening all around you, God can meet the need and make a way. So our offering this week is going towards um, the church foyer being refurbished for your enjoyment once we all meet up. And because we're not able to gather together, um, our giving is done on our website, turningpointcranbrew.org. So please go on and check out all our other online programs. Um, and yeah, know that this is an opportunity. Take it. It's there for you. Let's finish up and let's pray. God, we pray and thank you, Lord God, for all that you are doing and for the opportunity, Heavenly Father, that you laid out in front of us, Lord God, to put your love into action, Father, to step out in faith, Father God, knowing that you are using us to bless others to build up people's lives, Lord God, to build up your kingdom and to invest into something greater. 
Father God, may our giving give you glory, Lord God. May our giving bless others, Lord God. And um, may it always lift you and draw people closer to you, Lord God, that they be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your generous giving. Now get yourselves comfortable. Here we have Pastor Phil with a word from God for you today. Well, it's great to be with you here today, Turning Point Cranbourne, because today we head into a new term. As you know, we've been traveling through our vision for 2020, 2020 vision, and each term we're coming to a new level. And today we're entering into that new level, which we're calling Pursue, Pursuing God. And truly, that's the greatest thing we can do. But not only are we heading into a new term, this is a very special Sunday. And I'll fill you in a bit more as we travel along. So as we go through the sermon today, I encourage you, make sure you've got your Bibles ready, that we might journey together, because today is about how we can get in contact with God and know Him personally. What we're calling today's sermon is simply prepare to pursue. See, we're about to run after something. We need to get ourselves in order. And it's no use saying, I'm going to chase after something when we're out of shape. We've really got a plan and purpose. I remember a time my wife decided it was a great idea to go for a walk over some mountains in Tasmania. And it's Cradle Mountain. And so she got so excited. The next thing you know, we had oh, probably 20 people wanting to go and join her for this trip over there five-day trip carrying all their food and everything on their backs and they got all excited I had the great job of driving them up the hill and dropping them off and coming back well I still remember the day I got up there before I even got back to the house I got a call saying some of the people can't make it so I drove back up there and then I come back and then some more of the people couldn't make it and so as the days went on more and more people dropped out because they were not prepared. They had looked forward and they were in their pursuit to get from one side of Cradle Mountain to the other, but yet they had no idea what was in front of them. Today what I'll do is to encourage you to think, what is in front of you? Because today we're going to go through a journey and see what God's got for us. But let me just start off with the foundation of Scripture here in Acts chapter 17. And it says this, God has done all this so that when we pursue and look for him and reach out and will find him, for he isn't far from us. See, let me tell you, it takes a lot of work to get over one side of Cradle Mountain to the other. But you know how much work it takes for us to get to know God? Simply accepting the work of Jesus Christ. Because see, through Jesus, he has done the work. He has reached down so far to come to us now all we've got to do is respond to him and reach back. But as we journey through today, I want us to see what this really means. And I want to start off with a statement like this. It comes out of Esther. And see, through this time now that we are locked down, stage three restrictions here again in Victoria, having to do church only online, well, I don't know whether you've ever asked this question. Today, why am I here? Why couldn't I have been born a few years earlier? or just a few years later, and then I wouldn't have had to go through this. But the words that Esther was challenged with by her friend Mordecai was, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Today, as I share the word, I want to challenge you to think, maybe you are here today for a special reason, that you will be prepared to bring change to the world, so at that time, the Jews were in pain. The whole economy was falling apart. So what they did, they just said they're going to eradicate all the Jews. And that was going to be the answer. But hang on a minute. God promised that he's going to be there for the Jews. Just like he's promised for us. He's going to be there for us who love him. And see, sometimes we don't realize that what he does, he gets some people to stand up. Ezra was one at that time who was called to stand up. As we go into this, I just want to look at one other term too. 
a term that I picked up and I thought I couldn't help but mention today. See, there is no crown without a cross. Every one of us love it when we win something. And the term crown is we get crowned with glory, we get crowned with an honour, we get crowned with a medal, we get crowned, the royalty gets the crown. But the term cross means that you have to pay something. You have to go through this journey and you have to wear pain to get there. And I want us to see this today. Esther had to take a challenge to come through. Today we've got to take a challenge to come through. But if we will do it, we will win. So let us prepare as we start to go through. But before we do that, I just want to give you a foundation scripture of what we're going to be referring to a few times. In Luke chapter 9 it says this, And then Jesus said to them, Who are the... You'll cut this section. I'm going to give you a foundation scripture out of Luke chapter 9. Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So that's the call. If we want to pursue God, we want to get close to God, then we've got to actually deny ourselves daily. Well, that could be like spending some time in the Word every day. We've got a reading plan that's called Pursue. I hope that you've been tuning into that. It's now available on video as well as written. And also, if you can come to the office, we can arrange to give you a written version. But the main thing is we are to pursue. It says if we want to be disciples, we've got to take up the cross and we have to follow, pursue him. As I said before, this is a special day. And I just want to acknowledge some people who have pursued God. See, it was a year ago, or a bit over a year ago now, a group of people got together to say, we are willing to work with you, Phil. We want to see something happen. So it all started around about 12 years ago. I was at a pastor's conference, and while I was there, I was just praying and reading the Word, and all of a sudden I got this urge to start to mark on a map the places that God was going to call us to plant churches. The interesting thing at that time, we were one church. We hadn't planted a church. We didn't know how to plant a church. But God spoke to me and said, it's time. And one of those places was this place called Officer, which was interesting because I didn't even know what Officer was. I had to get a map out and it said, what is this place? Then I found this little country community. Well, today it's not a country community. It's a growing city. And God spoke to me those 12 years ago. And what happened was, we were able to rally a group of people together. And here in this picture just identifies this group that said, let's get together and start to talk and pray about, can we actually get a church? Started an officer. Then, of course, we got there. We found a hall, and it was a time where we got together as a team, just continued to evolve. And then we had the great joy of that very first service there. Many people came to support us as we started that new venture to place the house of God in this new developing city. But of course, we needed a leader. And it wasn't very long before God spoke to Sean and Jade. And next thing you know, Sean says, I want to be the part of this. I want to be a part of what's happening here. Then others, such as Andrew and Karen, said, we want to be part of it so much, we want to sell up and we want to go over there and become part of that community as we launch this new church. We also then had many others, like musicians, and that came down to help us to lead in worship and to find a way that we can actually lay foundations for us to grow. Then others got together and said, we're going to join you with outreach. So I'm going to mention all these things for a simple reason. See, God is about building his church. And how he does it, he looks for people like you and I, with all our limitations, with all of our lacks, He says, I can use you if you'll but be willing. Today, that's my challenge. So let's get into the Word now and let's see what God's got for us. A well-known passage of Scripture out of Proverbs says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, as we look at 2020 and we use the terms 2020 vision, we've seen that. And who would have thought that this year would have turned out to be the way it is? where a whole world now has been turned upside down, where countries where we talk about our freedom have been told to stay home, 
that we're told that you can't drive out of the city, you can't go over to the state border, you can't get a plane to fly somewhere. See, we never would have thought of this a time ago. But you know what? Each one of us are dependent on one thing, God being there for us. We need God to lead us. We need God to be the one who would take us and bring us into new things. And so today, we've been thrown into a new area. But let me tell you this, God has a way out. God has got an ultimate plan. See, Psalm says it like this, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. See, we can look to so many things and we are thankful that we live in a country like Australia. We are so blessed, but yet this country is not going to be what rescues us. It's our God that's going to rescue us. It's the Lord who brings salvation to this country. It's the Lord who brings hope to us personally. And so as we travel through this, I want you to see the picture that God has got a plan for you and you fit into it. Before I do that, I just want to mention a guy that was around at the very start of last century, a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffner. Well, he was a minister of the gospel, but the problem was the time when he was ministering the gospel, in his world, everything fell to pieces. In fact, the whole world fell to pieces. It was a time of the rise of Hitler, the Nazi party, that suddenly they were going to take over the world and eradicate the world of all the Jews. In fact, I couldn't help but think of this as I was looking at it. How do they start? Well, they started even bringing limitations to the church. They came up with this great idea. To make sure that we don't focus on how good the Jews were, we'll remove the Old Testament out of our Bibles. So the only Bible that the Germans were told they were allowed to have was the New Testament. Well... A strong Christian man like Bonhoeffner, he wasn't going to tolerate that. He rose up and he actually started to cre create a group of people. He was a, theolo a theologian, but he, in it, he founded a group and says, we will stay true to the truth and we will fight for it. He led many of the churches to form this new group that said, we will not give in. We know God will come through. We don't know how but hang on, he's inside a country that is now being led to a place where he felt was wrong. But he never, never gave up. Today, that's a challenge for us. Let's get back to this verse. Remember Jesus said to them, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up the cross daily and follow me. I want to just look at five different words if we can today. And these words come out of this passage to give us insight how we can actually see what God wants for us. First is our focus. Have you ever woken up in the morning and you sort of know that the light switch is somewhere over there and you're reaching for it, but you can't focus well enough to see it? Well, yes, we've got to get our eyes to learn to focus. The trouble is sometimes we start to focus on wrong things. Many times we focus on things that make us happy. You know, we can focus on, well, when the football comes back, we can go to that instead of church. Or we can say, look, we're going to spend our money on our holiday and we're not going to think about the house of God. Or we can let so many things get in our road and take our focus away. And the most amazing thing about it, God allows it to be. See, God is so committed to our free will that he will allow us to go into areas where he knows is bad for us, but because he wants to test our free will, he lets us do it. The ultimate, of course, is thinking of Adam and Eve. He could have stopped them. He could have removed the tree. But he said, I want to know that you have decided to pursue me, to follow me, to look to me. And that's what I want us to see. So when we're talking about focus today, I want us just to stop and think about the visual part. You know, we talk about focus and we can do it on cameras, but our eyes are the things we know. And yet, not all of us have perfect eyes. You know, some of us get a bit older and we've got to start wearing glasses because certain things happen, but some eyes always have limitations. Like, there's one particular thing where there is short-sightedness. So what happens? Well, you can see everything right here, 
but you can't see anything out there. And you start to say, well, is this my total world? You know, sometimes Christians can get a bit like that. They can see what's here today. They can rejoice in it. They can complain about it. But they can't see the ultimate. Because let me tell you, with Jesus, there is an incredible ultimate. We have eternity with him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But there's another problem too, nearsightedness. And they can only see what's right here, right now. They can't see anything else. They've got to say, well, what do I do about this? Then, of course, the other ones is that those who have got one eye. Well, we talk about that when we talk about the football teams. They're one-eyed Collingwood supporters. I think that's because the other people have picked their eye out. I'm not sure, but anyway, one-eyed. Well, the trouble with being one-eyed, God's designed us to have two eyes for a reason. The other one isn't spare. The two eyes are so we can actually understand depth and perception. We can see things and we can understand how easy it is to touch. There are some people who have lost sight in one eye and every now and then they've got to look, feel, try and judge distances because God made us to have two eyes to have clear vision. Being one-eyed is so often like this that we start to see things wrong in other people. We start to become judgmental of other people. We start to put them down. There's also the cross-eyed. Well, you know, cross-eyed is an interesting thing. You see people who've got cross-eyes, there's usually one eye looking at you and the other one's sort of going across, usually across their nose. And you think, why are they looking at their nose when they're talking to me? See, sometimes we're a bit like that. We say that we're going to serve God like this, but we actually do this over here instead. We compromise. We say we're going to trust God in everything, but then the offering plate comes around and we say, well, we can't trust God in that. We make these decisions, but we don't see it properly because one eye is focused on something else. Can I suggest that it would be like addictions, alcohol, drugs, greed, selfishness. We've got to make sure we get our focus back online here. Then there's tunnel vision, and this is a great one. You know, with a tunnel vision, yeah, you can see exactly where you're going, but you miss all the beauty of that around you. Too often, we become very narrow and we forget the beauty of what God has given to us. You know, as I said before, what a great country we live in. What a great blessing we have to be part of what God is doing here. So I encourage you, set your vision clear. See all that God has got for you. The Bible tells us this, that our eyes of understanding might be enlightened, that we might know the hope of the calling that we have. Let your eyes see him. Number two, we need to forsake. One, we need to see where we're going. Two, we're going to forsake the things that will stop us. The Bible says it like this in Joel. And Joel's interesting. Let me read the passage. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Now you look at that and you think, really? That's a bit heavy. Well, at that time, Joel was going through some issues as well because, see, their nation was going through pain. They were going through struggles, a bit like us. And then there was this cry. How do we fix it? forsake fasting forsaking what you like praying maybe instead of watching the tv you know weeping mourning standing in the gap crying out for we need to forsake ourselves and see that we're a part of what god has got to do good in this land it goes a little bit further down here in verse 13 it says rend your heart and not your garment return to the lord your god for he is gracious and compassionate the tradition at that time when things were going wrong, they wouldn't write, write a letter to the Prime Minister. What they would do is they'd tear their garments, they'd throw dirt in their hair and ash in their hair and they would cry and whinge so that everybody noticed them. Well, some Aussies, they do it the other way. They just go home and hide in a corner and they don't tell anyone that there's something wrong. But this is what it says here. When there's something wrong, rend your heart. Tear the heart and say, God, I need to change. I need to be the part of the answer. Don't worry about the garment. Return to the Lord. Make him number one in everything because he is passionate. He is gracious. You know, as we pursue him, he'll come to us. What about our thoughts? You know, we need to make sure our thoughts are getting in line because so often our thoughts get caught on other areas. 
The Bible says this, as he thinks, so he is. As he thinks in his heart, so he is. Too often what happens, we allow things to run around inside of us and we believe everything. Let me tell you an interesting occurrence. And I don't know why this happened, but I remember when I was just a teenager, my grandma was quite elderly, but she was the one who actually prayed for me and saw me come through to the Lord. And I remember this one time, I woke up with a dream. I dreamed that she had died. I dreamed that I'd been to the funeral. And the thing was, the dream was so strong, I was not sure. Was it a dream or was it real? See, I wasn't game to actually ask any of my family, just in case they said, don't you remember being to the funeral? Hang on, in my mind, I thought it was. So often, what happens inside of us changes the actions that we do. Second Corinthians puts it this way. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but the mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And you say, yeah. God gives us weapons to pull down strongholds, but we don't realize what it actually says. Casting down every argument and every thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Do you know how we get the weapons of God working in our life? Start to think like Jesus. Start to take the mind of Jesus into us. Start to speak out what Jesus says about us. Casting down every thought, imagination that will rise itself up against God and know that he's got the answer. What about our tongue? You know the trouble? Our tongue so often gets us into problems. Proverbs says this, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered, he's perceptive. Do you know the trouble is, when a fool opens his mouth, you can be sure of one thing. He's a fool then. We've got to see the big picture. Number three, forget. Too often we remember all the bad and we don't remember all the good. We've got to forget some of the past. Jesus says it like this. If you're trying to save your lives, you'll lose it. You're trying to hold on to yourself so much that you forget that God has got it all in hand. We try and hold on to everything. Forget about us. Put God as number one. It goes on further in Luke chapter 9 and about this. And he, Jesus tries to clarify these thoughts. And he says it like this. Let the dead bury the dead. Well, that's pretty hard. And whoever puts his hand to the plough and looks back is not worthy. They're pretty harsh things. Too often what we do is we try and face, focus on the areas that we want to hold to where we should be forgetting that which is past, knowing that our following our life in Christ is going to give us everything. Too often, we hang on to dead things in our life. Too often, we start a journey and we let go. We need to forget the handicaps and see the hope in God. Number four. No, we now need to call to follow. The area of pursuit. What does it mean to actually follow? Well, let me talk about this guy, Noah. One day... God speaks to him and he says, build an ark. Well, it wasn't a two-minute job. It took him many years, cutting down trees, hauling the things over, building the ark on this lovely dry ground where there was no water to sail the thing. He had no idea what he was doing, except he was following God. Abraham, he had minding his own business, happily raising his family, living in dad's farm. That means he was going to inherit dad's place. But now God said, why don't you go somewhere else? Back in those days, no tour guides, no maps. He just got up and went. Moses, yeah, he gets a call of God saying, I'm going to do some great things. The next thing is in the desert. And God turns up and says, go back to Egypt. Get these Israelites out and bring them into the promised land. Oh, what about David? Minding his own business, just looking after the sheep. And next thing you know, he's got to go and run a country. Not only that, he's got to deal with in-laws that cause him trouble. He's got, you name it, trouble after trouble. But yet, God said, follow me. What about some of the disciples? Peter, Andrew, James, John. Each one of them were minding their own business when Jesus says, come, follow me. 
So he follows just another word for us, pursuing God. We need to learn to do that. Number five, we need to have faith. It's no use having all these things on the knowledge and focus unless we actually start to operate some faith. And actually, James puts it so well. It says, fool, when will you ever learn that believing is useless without doing what God wants you to do? Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith. Do you know how you measure faith? By the actions you get involved with. Too often we say, yeah, 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 I believe God. Well, show us that you believe God by your actions. I just want to list these things here today. And I want to raise this. How is our focus? What have we forsaken to follow our God? Have we forgotten about the pull of the world? Have we now said, I am going to follow to the ends of the earth and I'm going to have faith to make it out? See, the truth is we've got to learn to do this. The question I'm going to ask you now is, after this lockdown, what is this world going to look like? Well, this world can look like what you want it to look like. I actually had this challenge that I was just praying the other day. If we are locked down, many of us will be saying, what's the new TV series? Or what's the new hobby I can do? Maybe I could ask you to think about this. When the lockdown is after, over I should say, when the lockdown is over, could you find yourself with a new talent? Could you become the new musician in church? Could you have learned so much of the scripture that you now become an evangelist in the church? Could you have spent time listening to God that you become the prophet to the community around us? See, we've got an incredible opportunity now. Some will say we're locked down, but no, we're being trained up. We have that opportunity now to take it and make it part of our life. So let's go back to this verse again in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus said to them, All, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross daily and follow me. Today I challenge you, like those ones who sold up to go down there and help plant a church and officer, like many others who have planted churches all around the place, like other missionaries who have gone out, like others who see their workplace as their mission field, their school, their home, whatever it is, let's see that we can follow Jesus in it. But there's a challenging word that comes right at the end of that passage there in Luke chapter 9. Anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work I plan for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. Today, don't lose sight. Don't lose focus. Don't give up on following him, pursuing. Because see, today, we are born for a time like this. I want us to actually declare this. I was born for such a time as this. I'm here today because God wants me here today because I'm going to be part of the answer that's going to see us rise to the other side and we're going to see incredible things happen as we see the church return to public gatherings, as we see the church become what it's called to be, reaching out to our community, making disciples, raising up, changing the world that is there because truly that's what we are pursuing God for, that we might be his mouthpiece in this community. Bless you all. Well, that's the end of our service for today. I hope you really enjoyed it. And remember that God has great things for you. Pursue them this week. But also remember what Pastor Phil said in the sermon today. He said, you were born for such a time as this. But he also reminded us that there is no crown without cross. And you know, today you might be feeling like you're going through a time of difficulty and trouble, turmoil, but I want to encourage you, come to the foot of the cross because God has good things for you. You know, give your life to the Lord, no matter what you've done, where you've been, where you are right now, Jesus has already paid the price for you on the cross. I encourage you, reach out to him, invite him to come into your life. He will be there for you. You know, this week, Remember, you were born for such a time as this. No matter what's happening in the world, this is a time for you and God is with you. So be blessed to be a blessing and see you again next week. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
We pray that you are encouraged by the service and that you're able to take away something that can motivate you for this week and for many more weeks to come. Now, the community and the fellowship that we experience here as Turning Point does not finish here. We're jumping on Zoom right now and you are welcome to join us to connect, to fellowship and to dive deeper into the Word today. Hope to see you there. Otherwise, have a great week. God bless you and God bless Australia.